Hello and welcome to the 307th edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm Matt Perkins. Tonight, uh, we're missing Coach Corey Burton because he has entered the transfer portal and is weighing his NIL options before he decides to recommit to the show. So, uh, it is a two-man booth tonight with myself and the third amigo up there in the second city, a man who never confuses Kazakhstan for Kyrgyzstan. It's our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook. Big one for uh, for my Hawkeyes tonight, Matt. Do you know who they're playing on the hardwood? Oh, it's the Dukies! It's the Dukies! I have to admit, I saw that they were playing, and then I saw right below it that Wisconsin was playing Maryland. I was like, I thought the Big Ten ACC Challenge was last week, and then I remembered that Maryland is in the Big Ten. <laughs> and Iowa, weirdly, has joined the ACC. <sighs> I mean, they are clearly right on the coast of the Atlantic there in Iowa City, Iowa. So mm-hmm. um, we yeah, have thanks. plenty uh, to get into this evening But before we uh, hop into uh, back on the coaching carousel, I should say, talk about a little transfer portal action, uh, Army, Navy, and more. I want to remind everyone that we are presented by betonline.ag. They continue to be your number one source for all of the online wagering things that you need. NFL, NBA, college football, you name it, they've got it over at betonline.ag. Head on over to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit with our promo code BELIEVE. That's B L E A V. Just read the hat, baby. Just read the hat. B E L E V. And uh, on your first uh, deposit, you will get a 50% welcome bonus over at betonline.ag. Betonline where the game starts and of course we are part of the mike farrell sports.com network and the arena group all right josh um coaching carousel has all it's done is mm. speed up since we were here last week the big news that everyone's talking about is Dion sanders to colorado uh this you know doesn't seem like a natural fit josh obviously Uh, Coach Prime has spent his short collegiate coaching career in Mississippi. He is originally from the Southeast. He has spent most of his life in the Southeast. No Pac-12 or Big 12 experience for that matter when he was in college. Uh, Colorado was a, well, was a Big 8 power, I should say. So it's been a minute. There's been a whole lot. There's been a whole lot of... What's that? You're not, counting his time, you're not counting his time with the 49ers as Pac-12 experience? Uh, no, I mean, that's Bay Area, but I don't think uh, Candlestick <laughs> is anywhere near uh, Stanford or Cal play, unfortunately. Um, Josh, this was a peculiar hire to me. They seem to have thrown a bunch of cash at him that they don't even have. The AD went out and has already said, like, yeah, we don't have the money yet. <laughs> this seems like a giant house of cards that's destined to fail. I, but I do see the upside. But before I go on a tirade, Josh, I want to see the floor to you. Well, uh, I mean, the money issue aside, um, that's just a fancy way of the the school basically said, yeah, there's going to be a uh, <laughs> special special extend, uh, expenditure for the uh, students in what they're going to have to uh, pay to get tickets. Um I think it is a low risk, high reward hire for both people. Um, As much as Prime loved to talk about SWAC and historically black colleges and universities, um, he always wanted one of those big time jobs. He, you know, that was that. And Colorado counts as a decently sized job it's a big 12 job uh or pac 12 job if he does well there um other power conference schools are going to come calling um so I, i think for him it's a stepping stone uh to bigger things um and if he does horribly everyone will say well it's colorado it's colorado they're they're terrible and for colorado's perspective they were 111 they have been one of the worst power five teams for really the last several years. 
Um, so if Prime succeeds, they're in a better foundation going forward. And if he fails, it's eh, too bad. It was a SWAT coach. Why'd we hire him? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it, it's just it's a big swing from an athletic department that I guess is just trying to make noise. There, I mean, they've got some great coaches that are coming in there. I mean, they've got Sean Lewis as an offensive coordinator, who's the head coach at Kent State, who really knows offense. You know, I, I they're going to get some great talent. They've already had tons of guys commit, so they have offers. You know, they're going to be hitting the portal like it's no one's business. You saw his opening speech, which I think was a lot of the headlines are actually taken a bit a bit out of context. He didn't say he didn't tell everyone to get in the portal. He said basically get in the portal if you don't want to come in and work, like which is what every yeah. single coach is going to say, right? That's like kind of the thing that 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 they say in this day and age. That doesn't really get to me. I see the upside of this hire. I just don't see him lasting. More none than of what he none of what he said really got to be honestly. Yeah, but I I saw people like getting their panties in a bunch about. Uh, oh, he's, you know, told everyone to get in the portal, blah, blah, blah. It was like, no, that's actually not really said. You just read the headline. You didn't actually, like, take three minutes and actually listen to what he said. Um, to be he, fair, based on how Colorado looked last year, everyone joining the transfer portal might actually be a good thing. Yeah, most of them, at least. That's for, <coughs> that's for, that's for darn sure. Uh, I think there's no way he's there in three years, no matter what. If he has success, you know he's gone to the SEC. Uh, if he fails, they'll cut bait and run. Like it's the this is yeah. a very short term solution for a Colorado program that has, I think, bigger issues in the long term without a proper conference home. Well, I, I think the you, you know the the talk coming out of some of their new leadership at the university they they are trying to adjust that they're trying to adjust some of their very stringent uh, standards for athletes, uh, trying to relax things to be a little bit more competitive. Uh, with it. And, you know, if, if it works out and prime's only there for three years before bolting, um, it, it just raises the floor and it raises who Colorado could hire for their next coach. So, you know, as it being a uh, low risk, uh, high reward hire, I'm, I'm inclined to give it a solid B. Yeah. I, I give it a B as well. Like somewhere between like a B and a B minus. I don't have any issue with it because they're Colorado. I, yeah. if let's say, I mean, Stanford would never do this, but let's say a UCLA had done this, right? I think that is a much bigger risk reward situation there for a UCLA, which has more of an established brand. You know, I, I understand why a blue bud wasn't going to take a chance him. I understand why an Auburn wasn't going to take a chance on him, even if they're not a blue blood. They somehow think that Hugh Freeze is a better choice. And, you know, I don't even I don't agree with that. But I think the I think the one thing that could impact Prime's uh, general hope for for his trajectory is uh, he's got a little bit of uh, PJ Flackitis in him, mm. where you're you're hiring a spokesman and a rah rah guy who has great slogans and uh, definitely brings a lot of eyeballs. But you know Minnesota's changed their jerseys; they have row the boat on all their stuff. And let, let's be honest, Alabama ain't going to have row the boat on their jerseys. No. Uh, you know, so, you know, Prime talked about swack. He had clothing made up that said swack. You know, any slogan that he's going to use, the Michigans, Ohio State's, Alabama's, Georgia's, Tennessee's of the world, they're not putting that crap on their field. So uh, Prime is always going to have a little bit of a – uh you know, limited roster of who would hire him. If the funds had work, we and we talked about Georgia Tech last week, uh, so we're not going to relitigate all the financial issue. But I think if they had the funds, Prime in Atlanta with Georgia Tech made a lot of sense. Yes, but I don't think Prime is interested in the academic side whatsoever. And at Georgia Tech, you have to be. You, you yeah. don't have a choice at Georgia Tech. That's why somewhere that's why an auburn makes a lot more sense yeah. um so okay well let's continue on though because uh, one of yeah, the jobs see. that opened up uh that we talked about last week was cincinnati with luke fickle moving to wisconsin a uh, word has come out as we are recording that jim leonard will not stay on with the team next year so they have pretty much oh. completely wiped uh the coaching staff 
uh, from the 2022 Wisconsin team. Um, anyway, Cincinnati has replaced Luke Fickle with Scott Satterfield from Louisville, which, Josh, I have to say, I actually really like for both parties involved. Well, I, I understand from Satterfield's perspective, he is getting out of town before his seat turned into a raging mm -hmm. inferno. Uh, I believe he pulled a Dana Holgerson in, uh, in beating the, uh, the pitchforks by a season. Um, you know, he's an interesting guy. He's um, 51 and 24 at App State, three straight Sun Belt titles. Um, got them to four straight bowl games. They won three of those bowl games. Um, they were flirting with rankings each year. Uh, he went 38 and 10 in conference. He was a can't miss hire by Louisville. And he was 25 and 24, 15 and 18 in the ACC. So is he, is he the guy at app state that you're getting? If you're Cincinnati, awesome is he the guy at louisville you're getting less awesome there's been some unflattering stuff said about him by former players uh a parent said that uh uh scott satterfield basically never talked to his kid four years on campus there so uh there there are some question marks by it um i'll be honest i i caught a lot of louisville football this season uh because i had satterfield getting canned i was curious what they looked like and there were times where they looked like a top 25 team and there were times where he looked absolutely clueless on the field uh i am curious why you like the hire so much i was inclined to give it a c at the best no I, i've got it as a solid b because i think that satterfield still has a little bit something about him he was actually getting some juice on the recruiting chair at louisville i know I think he was dealt a worse hand than some people thought at Louisville. I think that situation was worse. It was more rotten from the inside than he was given credit for. You know, they've had some great wins and some terrible losses. Yes, he's very Jekyll and Hyde. Absolutely. That team, they with when Malik Cunningham was on, like that team looked incredible. I like this move because I think that Cincinnati's moving into the Power Five next not for the 23 season but for the 24 season and he's now a guy who's coached at both levels and tech, you know he's won at both levels like he's not like he's a complete failure at louisville and so for me one of the things that i really like about this hire for cincinnati is you got a guy who has won at both the group of five level and the power five level obviously to a lesser extent at louisville but he has experience and he knows how to recruit he pulled five star reuben owens to Louisville for the 2023 cycle, I mean, or 24th cycle, I should say, he's probably not going to stay now that he's gone, but still, it proves that he knows that he can actually get some things done on the recruiting trail, and Cincinnati, for all that it was under Luke Fickle, you know, it, it's never really turned into a recruiting powerhouse. They'll grab an occasional four-star, but Satterfield seems to have built ties. Josh, I think he's turned that corner a little bit with the relationship part of it i think he you know you know we've all we've heard those stories that, that you mentioned but i'm a little bit more bullish on this i think than a lot of other people are i like it for both sides so i think for i think for satterfield it's an a i think for cincinnati it's a b yeah all right so uh, compelling a compelling argument you didn't win me over but compelling. so now another school that i think did a great job for themselves is Liberty. They got they got Jamie Chattel. Uh, we all know he can coach. He is the architect of Coastal Carolina and their three-year dominant run over the last three years, one of the best teams in the belt. Uh, for him, he's going to Liberty and getting an F- minus from me because why anyone would want, would want to go to Liberty is beyond me, but maybe that's just my own personal feelings about uh, the university and the people that run it. But Josh, I don't understand this though for Chadwell because I feel like he's like going to an FCS independent is a really is Liberty. Well, they're, they're going to be conference. in yeah, they're going to be in a conference um, just next season, so he's not going to serve any time as an independent. 
Um, I just, you, it, you know, it feels, look, like, he, it feels weird to me. I feel like he had better offers or he'd been rumored around better jobs uh, even last year, much less Liberty. I'm sorry. Like that is not like he was a guy who's in talk, you know, who people talked about for a low end power five job, a Vanderbilt. He was, I know he interviewed for Vanderbilt last year. Well, so that's the thing. I, you know, he, um, I think uh, by all accounts, his uh, his dream job being from Tennessee and playing in the state of Tennessee were the Vols. Uh, he got passed over by Pruitt in his home state. South Carolina passed him over for um, Beamer Ball. Um, so I, I think from his perspective, he was wondering like, oh, gee, like, is there something about my style of play? You know, his offense has some option elements to it. Um, when uh, when he was at Coastal before Grayson McCall, uh, his record was pretty pathetic. So I think there's some feeling that he might be uh, riding the coattails of an absolutely brilliant college quarterback. So I think there's real concerns about why some teams might not have hired him. I'm, I'm wondering if he had waited a few days what Louisville might have done. Um interesting hypothetical but yeah, i i know why you know louisville being closer to state yeah. tennessee he's got a lot of tennessee yeah. ties louisville yeah. already recruits a ton in the but, state of um, tennessee but you know what he he's going from making 900 some thousand dollars a year to millions of dollars every year four million a year um you understand from that perspective if he can't get a power five job he might as well be getting paid Yes. Um, but yeah, great, great hire for Chad. Well, I'm with you. I, or a great hire for Liberty. Uh, but I'm with you. I, you know, you and I, we're not fans of the Fallwells. Uh, yeah. Or anything that no. goes down in that institution. So uh, we're uh, running out of time here on the um, carousel. But yeah. We've let's got, we, let's we've, express through it. Yeah. Let, we're we're, we're going to hit, put, put our foot down on the gas. Yep. Uh, let's go yep. to Coastal Carolina, uh, where yeah. Jamie Chadwell just left who, uh, Josh, we've already had one F hiring that in Hugh Freeze this cycle. That, that's Universal F. I think we have a second one here. Tim Beck, are you serious? They were, he was um, about to get fired from NC State. Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, look, he was a Broyles nominee, uh, which is the coach of the year as an assistant, a decade ago at Nebraska. That's the last time anyone's liked him. Uh, he, he's basically been run out of his last few jobs. I don't know what Coastal saw in this, um, and it, it's really sad to see uh, Coastal going to be falling apart because if I'm Grayson McCall, I'm either hitting the portal or taking my chance at the combine and, and, and seeing if I can maybe sneak into like a fourth, fifth round type situation. Josh, your Hawkeyes already hit, hit the portal for a, for a solid quarterback in Kate McNamara. Mm. Uh, Wisconsin's quarterback left in the portal. We'll talk about that here yeah. in a minute. We'll talk about that. Um, no. Uh, UAB, uh, Bill Clark obviously stepped down before the season. Interim Brian Vincent did a, you know, a, a, a very noble job, but they were always looking for a, you know, doing a national search and they came across a unique candidate, Trent Dilfer, who's been coaching at Lipscomb Academy here in Nashville, Tennessee. They are a top 10 team in the country. Um, you know, uh, we've seen coaches try and uh, well fail at unlv to go from the local powerhouse high school uh you know birmingham two and a half hours south of where we are here in nashville dilfer has the elite 11 connections he's he's very well connected in football circles we know this he's the elite 11 guy he knows yeah. all the quarterbacks but it's uab in birmingham i am a huge proponent of birmingham the city myself i i think it is a lovely lovely place to go but i think it's going to be tough and with no Re, you know, no collegiate coaching experience whatsoever. His staff is going to tell us an awful lot. I mean, the president of the university already tried to kill this program once. Uh, maybe he's trying it a second time because um, it, it was a, a very quick decision and not a name that I was expected at the least. I mean, this is a complete uh, question mark. This is an incomplete. We'll we'll know we'll know a few games into Delfer's career if it's going to work or not. Okay, so Josh, uh, now I need you to do uh, an either or for me. Yeah. Would you uh, rather ha hire for your program Tom Herman out of the unemployment line or Kevin Wilson, uh, considering how the things uh, finished off <laughs> at Indiana? Because that is what FAU and Tulsa have done. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, um, uh, you know, I'm a big time Kevin Wilson supporter. Um, his uh, uh, allegations at Indiana were investigated thoroughly and he and the university were let off the hook. It was, uh, it was a little bit of a Craig James situation where it was, uh, a parent, uh, sticking up for their kid and it didn't quite work out. Uh, you know, Kevin Wilson basically created any success Tom Allen has had so far. And the farther Allen has gotten away from Kevin Wilson, uh, the worse Indiana has gotten, um, so, you know, Kevin Wilson knows offense incredibly well. Um, I think that's a great hire um, for Tulsa. Um, you know, Tulsa had a really good passing attack this season. They've had really good offenses in the past. I like that continuity. Um, but I actually, I like the Tom Herman hire also. I know he's, we, we like to make fun of him. You know, he, he kisses all of his players, which um, I just, I've never done a coach to do that. That's kind of a weird thing um but hey you do you tom herman uh, i think this is a pretty good fit for herman he's very comfortable in that group of five situation he was way better at houston than he was at texas um he also knows offenses really well um so you know tulsa fau i'm giving them both solid b plus hires good for you josh you are more bullish than i am those are high c's for me um uh two last ones uh, Texas State fires Jake Spavadol, hires J.G. or sorry, G.J. Kinney uh, from Incarnate Word. Josh, to me, this is an absolute home run. When you're Texas State, you got to do something new and unique and different. And if anyone has watched Incarnate Word play offense, they know that it is about to get silly down there. Yeah, the uh, the one concern that you have to give is this is his only year at incarnate word and incarnate word had an incredible offense under their previous coaching staff. They did. Did he build anything or did he continue it? Um, you know, that that's tough to know. Um, he does have some other nice stops on his career. Um, you know, he's been at SMU, Arkansas. He was in the NFL for a moment. And then finally 2020 got his first offensive coordinatorship at Hawaii for one year, then UCF for one year, then incarnate word. So you, you know, you're Texas state, you're not going to have a huge pool to pick from. I think they did pretty good. All things considered you gave it an a I, I'm giving it a B plus uh, a minus range just because he's only had one year head coach experience, but there's really no reason Texas state can't be more successful at football. There's no reason they can't be like North Texas. No, absolutely not. Well, speaking of a, of a team that re- fired their head coach as well, since we last talked, North North, North Texas uh, <laughs> ditched Seth Luttrell. Uh, though, no, but uh, but I mean they've made bowl games and stuff. I, I'm talking. No, no, no that, that's very true. Um, finally, uh, Jeff Scott had been ditched at South Florida. He's replaced by Alex Golish, the offensive coordinator from Tennessee. For me, this is a, an incomplete. Cause I, Goalish. I mean, I don't even know how much that offense was his. I mean, uh, with Hypo running the show, I will say though, with Jeff Scott being fired and seeing how things went in year one for Venables and uh, Elliot, I can safely say that Davos Winnie might have the worst coaching tree of all time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely awful his coaching tree. Um, so Alex Goalish, you know, yeah, he we know him from Tennessee offensive coordinator. Um, but he was at UCF in 2020, uh, spent some time in the big 10 and, uh, was with Illinois. He was at Iowa state during some of Iowa state's best years, including coaching their, uh, tight end and running, running game coordinator, um, back in 2016, 2019, Iowa state had some incredible tight end play and running games during those seasons. So, um, I think he's more than just his, his time at Tennessee, I'm pretty intrigued by the hire. South Florida is at about as far rock bottom as you can get. They are getting a coach that is just 38 years old. Um, if if it works out, this could be a really great hire for South Florida. The thing that I'm curious about is, Matt, he was born in Moscow, Russia. Do you think he's the first coach born in the Soviet Union to be a, a head football coach? Well, if he's... So if he's 38, then yeah, he would have been born in the Soviet Union. 
So yeah. but is there been a, you know, I feel like there, there, there might have been like some random, like Ukrainian or like, you know, like, like part Ukrainian or someone who like, you know, Estonian or something like that. Right. Like, like you know, part like some, I feel like there's someone who was like born in the Baltic States in like the seventies or eighties and like got, or like sometime in the seventies got out, like right as the wall was collapsing, came to America and then became the great coach. <laughs> That's the story. And I'm sticking to it. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm I'm gonna uh, just assume he's the first. All right. Um. So, uh, just one other firing, Marcus Arroyo, uh, out at UNLV since we last spoke. Uh, yeah. Don't know who's gonna replace him yet. Rumors of Ed Orgeron, which would be an awful uh, no, idea. They, they, uh, no, they they no they they uh, they realized that Ed Orgeron was a dumb thing. They hired somebody. I saw it earlier today. I'm oh gosh, even since it I up. put together the even since I put together our rundown, it's changed in the last two hours. Yeah, no, I, I I saw I saw it on the wire, and uh, it, I was like, "Yeah, it's UNLV. Do I really need to commit this to memory?" And I did. No, well, I will also say that uh, they, they hired. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They hired Arkansas defensive coordinator Odom. Oh Barry Odom. Oh A plus plus. Who was A plus? Yeah, he was five. He, he was uh, five hundred or better every season at Missouri. Correct. Uh, took them, I think, to four bowl games and at least one SEC title game. Uh, I, I don't know if that was Barry Odom. Uh, was I don't. I maybe so not. Th- th- this isn't so uh, uh, Tim Lesser out at Western Michigan. We should say as well. Don't know if we've ever mentioned that. But wow, uh, and we'll mention it once Western Michigan hires someone. Yeah, Barry Odom. Though. Barry Odom. Wow. What that is a yeah, Barry I'm Odom. Surprised. I thought Odom um, would have been a perfect fit for Colorado, like UNLV. That is a slam dunk. Like all of the whatever sports adjectives I can use for it. That is incredible. Yeah. For okay. Uh, so Missouri fans are probably upset that we were so off on him. Uh, Barry Odom, 2016 to 2019, uh, his first season, they were under 500. They went four and eight from that point on seven, six, eight and five, six and six uh, went to two bowl games. They didn't make one in 2019, despite being six and six. Um, but yeah, it, it still stands. This is a guy with head coaching experience. He did all right at Missouri. Um, long, long, long time defensive mind. Uh, long time at Missouri as defensive coordinator. He was just the DC when they would have gone to those SEC title games. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, but okay. yeah, yeah, this is a this is a really good hire. Yeah, but a great job. All right, um, let's move then to the biggest news of the week because it is officially portal season. Josh, uh, there are already more than one thousand players in the transfer portal. There, there's yeah, so and many- I ranked all of them. I'm just kidding. I, I, I don't even know where to start here. I was going to ask like, what was the most surprising transfer for you? First of all, for me, it's surprising that I was even accepting transfers because last year they didn't take, they didn't <laughs> take any yet. Iowa already has a quarterback and apparently a tight end on the way as well uh, in uh, the Michigan roommates, Cade McNamara and uh. Eric all Josh a as a Hawkeye, how does it feel to finally get a transfer? And B, what are your thoughts overall here on the transfer portal in general? Well, A, I'm, I'm glad that we're finally taking advantage of it. I mean, uh, whether you like or dislike the portal, uh, to have your team completely ignore something is completely irritating. It would be like, uh, do I, I think the uh, atomic bomb is humanity. No, would I be upset if uh, our country did not have that option for defense? So yeah, it's it's good that I was taking advantage of it. Um, getting Cade McNamara is huge. Um, he basically brings with him the uh, game management of Spencer Petrus with the ability to make bigger plays. Um, you know, I, I think... Uh, I think 90% of Spencer Petrus' issues this year were coaching. Um, I don't want to throw this kid under the bus. He was a hard, hard fighter for Iowa. Um, but the, the 10% that was Petrus's fault, uh, he just had no foot speed. He, he really struggled with an internal clock and, and knowing when to throw the ball away and, and taking an incomplete pass than a 10-yard sack. So, you know, just from that alone, Padilla was a, a better option and uh, and getting Kate is obviously a huge upgrade. Um, 
just to tie a bow on Iowa and Spencer, I am so bummed for Spencer that he had to have shoulder surgery. He's out for the bowl game. I wanted him to suit up one more time. Um, you know, he, he ended his career against Nebraska. He ended two for six before his shoulder injury that you, you just don't want to see any kid at their career that way. It, it, it absolutely sucks. And like I said, he is, he is like, you know, he did post game interviews every game. Frickin' Brian Ferentz didn't bother to do that. So, I mean, th- this kid is a stand-up guy. Uh, in terms of my thoughts on the portal overall, um, it's one of those things where probably not the NCAA because we can't trust them to do anything, but um, whatever governing body emerges when the NCAA is dead and gone, what needs to be figured out is the name image likeness money combined with kind of this wild west transfer immediate uh, availability. You have people entering the portal and then signing with their new school in like a matter of minutes. It's like, Hmm, I wonder if there was any tampering with that. Hmm. Gee. Uh, When you have players like JT Daniels, who have essentially become rentals and he's on his fourth school now. Um, it just makes it very weird. So, um, you know, I don't want to destroy player empowerment and say, oh, let's go back to the old days where you have to sit out a season. And I'm not saying, hey, let's uh, remove name, image, likeness, and you're paid in your classwork because you get a free education. Uh, no, I like the portal and I like NIL. The two of them combined needs a little bit of some framework and some guidelines. And it's something that we should probably think about and be more articulate about over the summer. And definitely people way smarter than us should also probably be thinking about because you do get some very weird situations where people are in the portal for literally minutes and it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Josh, um, I'm going to give you a list of quarterbacks who have entered the transfer portal. You are going to, t- yes. I want you to rank these guys who, of who you would want the most to who you'd want the least. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? So we well, have, I gotta say, K- I gotta say, I want Cade the most, right? I'm taking Cade out Homer. of the equation for this, yeah. for the purposes. So these are people unsigned. These are people unsigned. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So I'm All going right. to start with my very own Graham Mertz. From the University of Wisconsin. Oh. We have Drew Pine from Notre Dame. We have Keaton Slovis from Pitt and before that USC. We have Brennan Armstrong from Virginia. We have Jeff Sims from Georgia Tech. We have Hudson Card from Ding. Tech. I want I want uh I want Brennan Armstrong. He gets a ding. There you, Hudson Card from Texas, DJ Uyangalole from Clemson, and Devin Leary from NC State. Ding, 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 ding. The bell's going crazy. Devin Leary is clearly the best of clearly. this bunch. Okay, interesting. Give me yeah. your argument. Well, so, you know, obviously he was banged up this year. And, yes, uh, very much. He had, he, had, he had Tim Beck uh, serving as an <laughs> anchor around I mean, <laughs> him. Um, but uh, his body of work um, speaks for itself. He was incredible last year. He coming into this season, uh, he's the reason why you, Matt, were incredibly high on NC State. You had them, I think, winning the national title. You said that they were going to not even do the playoffs because NC State was going to be that good. I did have them in the playoffs. To be fair, I did have them in in my official. (laughs) Um, They were in my. They were in the playoff for me. And I was very high on NC State as well. I was not not as high as you, but I was also high on them. Um, I think he has. It, it, it's such a cliche to say he's the whole package, but he, he really does. He can make NFL level throws. He's got really good arm strength and he is just fleet of foot enough, just athletic enough um, to get out of trouble. But also when things open up, we've seen him make, you know, 10 yard scrambles before. Um, I, I think, I think a, a decent comp is, He's a little Aaron Rodgersy. Oh, Josh, that's Rogers. Rogers' athleticism is 
Rogers is way more athleticism than Leary. I, I I said he's a little. He's not Aaron Rodgers. He's a would homeless not say man. At Aaron Rodgers in this case, he's a he is a homeless or an unhoused person. Yeah. Um, Aaron Rodgers. Like, like this like, is not a no. Well, no. The, the reason I'm bringing Aaron Rodgers up is, um, Rodgers is not, um, you know, uh. Why am I Patrick Mahomes? I was completely brain farting there. You, you know, Mahomes it, it can run way faster than Aaron Rodgers could dream about running. And, you know, Patrick Mahomes can can flip it with his off hand and, and have it go 80 yards. Like he's an out of the world specimen. And then on the other end of the line, you got, you know, Drew Bledsoe, who's who's a statue. And you and I both love Drew Bledsoe. We have a soft spot for Bledsoe. And so Rogers to me is kind of in the middle in that he is in, in that he's got what you like about NFL arms plus a little bit of athleticism. So that's, he's living in the Aaron Rodgers block of these extremes of the statue versus the crazy runner. That's, that's the only reason I did Aaron Rodgers. but yeah, I, I really like Devin Leary. Okay. I, and for I like, me, Brennan, for, for me, Brennan Armstrong. So let me make the case. By let me the make worst the case. new coach. <laughs> And the terrible offensive coordinator. See, you need to let me make the case then for Ben Armstrong because I also very much like Devin Leary, as you mentioned. NC State was my preseason pick to be sort of like the the fourth team that everyone was rotating out to be in the playoff. And I love that team. I love that defense. And I love Leary a lot. He got banged up. Offensive line wasn't quite as good this year without Ikea Kwanu. So if I am a plug-and-play if I need a plug and play quarterback, that also probably means our offensive line ain't that great, which means guess what? They're going to yeah. have to do a little bit of running around and may have to shed some guys off of them. Well, who better to do that than the, than the quarterback from Virginia who just a season ago threw for 4,400 yards ran for another 250 and nine scores, like 5,400 yeah. total the- yards of offense, 40 plus touchdowns. Like, he can do it all. Give me Brennan Armstrong. He might go to Wisconsin. He might. He might find that argument compelling. However, I, I think where we probably are all expecting him to go, and anyone who follows college football is probably expecting him to go to Pittsburgh because his offensive coordinator from last year, when he put up all those monster staff, stats, is on Narduzzi's staff. And as you mentioned, uh, the oft-injured Keaton Slovis is out. One other name to keep an eye on for Armstrong, I know, is Notre Dame. Uh, Notre Dame is very much actually in on both of those two guys. Illinois is said to have been putting the full full court press on Leary. Going to be just really interesting to see all of the fallout from this as we continue. Okay, let's move into looking at yeah. our were, brackets. Well, I was, I was just going to say, Matt, were there any other players? I know we're running a pinch long, but were there any other players that caught your eye? Too many. I mean, to, I mean, uh, there were okay. 11 Alabamians. The fact that there were... Um, <laughs> Alabamians. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's always interesting when you see a team in the going into the playoff that has multiple guys going into the portal in Michigan. Now, obviously all those guys were out injured out for the rest of the season. So there is something there, you know, they know they want to continue to play football, but you know, still entering the portal when your team is about to be going, you know, to the college football playoff, right. As the two seed, that that's a little bit that, that caught my eye a little bit. Anything catch yours? Uh, at risk of sounding like a homer, uh, Arlen Bruce, the fourth, leaving Iowa. He's, um, you know, a local kid from Ankeny um, High School. Um, I think he, I think he has the potential to be um, a very, very good wide receiver for for anyone that picks him up. So uh, I think that, Justin that one Jacobs is, an Iowa is a fan. bigger loss for the Hawks than uh, than him. Oh, linebackers are deepest position. It, he, he was never going to see the field at Iowa. So, um, and, yeah. uh, but also the linebacker, but from Indiana is probably, is another guy who is an absolute beast yeah. of an athlete. Uh, and he's got a little yeah. brother who is a senior in high school right now and a, a four-star safety who people are talking about the two of them being kind of a package deal, one through the portal 
and one through one as a true freshman. So the McCullough yeah. brothers from the state of Indiana to keep an eye out on. Yeah. Uh, are there any names you think will uh, withdraw? No. I mean, at this point, I mean, there will be some, but <laughs> I know that there are programs yeah. out there though who say, once you go in the portal, like, you know, yeah. the, the door has closed behind you. So yeah. it's, it, it can get a little dicey. Yeah, fair enough. All right, all right. FCS time. Let's FCS do it. FCS time, Josh. Uh, Josh, it's feeling. My really, bracket's looking very good. Mine's looking very chalky because we've got all the seeded teams uh, heading into the quarterfinals. Um, the yeah. the the biggest one, you know, the biggest game of the weekend for me was was that Furman Incarnate Word game. Uh, not just because it was super close, but because it was nip and tuck the whole way in with the added news about Incarnate Word and their coach, and their coaching staff. Uh, what game jumped out to you over the weekend? Did you uh, really tune in on? Um, well, William and Mary was, you know, five seed. And I think we we said, hey, they're they're in a good conference, but it's William and Mary. And, and we kind of wrote them off and. Well, in their debut, they they took on Gardner Webb, who won their opening game fifty two forty one, and William and Mary dropped just a nuclear explosion on the Bulldogs. They they beat Gardner Webb fifty four fourteen, um, and Montana State, who I have you know going going to the semis, and I was like, oh, their defensive coordinator suspended, and they they got past Weber State. Um, this this. William and Mary team um, uh, is is certainly a lot better than I had anticipated, to say the least. So that one catches my eye. Um, South Dakota State putting an absolute hurting on Delaware. Yeah. Um, Josh, I, I don't know if there's... I'm not sure if there's an all-star team of the other seven teams left. When they are combined, that could be South Dakota State. They look like a machine to me. Oh come on! That's, that's I know that's hyperbole. hyperbole. That, that's hyperbole. Even gets it just, just because North Dakota State that's absurd. and Sac State and, and Sac yeah. State, but Richmond gave Sac State a run. Yeah. Well, you know what? If South Dakota State wins it all by the transitive properties of the head-to-head win, that means that my Hawkeyes are FCS champions because we famously beat them seven to three to start the season. Uh, with two safeties and a field goal. Congratulations. So, so just just keep that in mind. Um, no, the yeah, this you know I know it's all chalk and it is kind of like oh man, there's no unseated team that made a run, but we still have some really incredibly intriguing things. Holy Cross is undefeated this year. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, bad. Well, not. Not horrible. Bad was too strong of a word. Uh, less prestigious conference a- taking on taking on the incredible South Dakota State team. We have Samford, who just kind of like has been very like William and Mary, just kind of quietly plodding along. I feel like even Incarnate Word gets more attention than William and Mary and Samford because of their offense. So we've got some really really exciting games. I, I mentioned the William and Mary Montana state game. You, you talked about yours. Um, I am, I, I mean, I just don't know where to begin. I'm so excited about these games. I mean, for me, it, it, it starts with the incarnate word sack state game. That's the yeah. game to me of the weekend. I, that that's the one. Yeah. If I, ha- if it is must watch for me is that it's at Sac state incarnate word has this incredible offense, but no coat, like what's going to happen there. I could see anything happening, but we've been big fans of Sacramento state. Mm-hmm. You know, this whole time. who's your most vulnerable. Who's my, cause uh, Sac state had the closest game of correct. any team. Cor- well, no, Are they I, your no, most it, vulnerable? no, incarnate word did. Incarnate Word won by three. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, the, uh, the most vulnerable. I, I the... meant, I, I, I didn't phrase it very well. I meant of the favored teams this weekend. Oh, it's got to be Montana State, just because of the way. You, I mean, you talked about William and Mary. It's got to yeah, be. It's yeah. got to be Montana yeah. State. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably the, the most, the biggest toss up out of all four games. Uh, so 
Um, are we revising any of our final four? Are we hedging any bets right now? Are we logging on to bet online? Well, I mean, I had Weber State. Anything? I had Weber State all the way in the final four, so that was already out for me. That okay. was my one long shot. But I other, otherwise, my, I had, otherwise, I had Sac State, North Dakota State, and South Dakota State, and I'm feeling great about all of those. Um, my final four is still intact, but my final four was all chalk. I had one, two, three, and four in my final four. Yeah, I mean, I had one, two, three, and unseated. So, I, you know, yeah. I, I think that, I mean, Sam for North Dakota State is just going to be interesting for two very different styles of football this weekend. Uh, can the Crusaders of Holy Cross keep their miracle season going? I mean, that's going to be... God's on their side. Well, well, their God is on their side. The, uh, the, the Catholic God is on their side. I'm not sure yeah. if... Uh, other gods are on their no. side, but uh, in the last in the last thirty seconds, Matt, who are you uh, most disappointed is out of the tournament? Who do you want to keep seeing? Weber. Yeah, I mean, the, I would. Yeah, just um, from my my own picks, obviously. Yeah. And then we, yeah, it, it's got to be Weber for me. Uh, I think though that Gardner Webb team was an interesting one as well. Uh, um, but yeah, I'll go with oh Weber. How about you? I I got to pour one out for Southeastern Louisiana. They they knocked off Idaho in that crazy game where Idaho's kicker slipped. So they held on there and then they, they gave Samford everything they could handle that 48 42 win for Samford. I, I, I thought S Southeastern Louisiana was playing some really impressive ball. And I'm going to be honest, uh, you know, I, I feel like you, you and I have pretty good FCS credentials, all things considered. I really don't know much about the Southeastern Louisiana team, but they caught my eye. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's wrap it up here quickly with the last regular season game of the season. That is Army and Navy. Uh, Josh, Commander-in-Chief's trophy has already been settled. Air Force already won that. Guess what? Doesn't matter. Throw out the record books. Navy had a really strange season to me, but... You know, this is actually one of the more even matchups we've had in a long time. There was a long stretch of Navy dominance. Then there was the last five years seems to have been Army dominance. They've met at a little bit of an equal equilibrium this year, albeit one where both are probably below where they would really want to be. Navy comes in four and seven. Army comes in five and six. But I think Navy's four and seven is a little bit deceiving considering some of their wins like at ranked central florida um you know it, things like that at east carolina who we know to be a solid squad you know i i think that this is a this is a true toss-up so what are you looking at here yeah I, so army is a team that i really thought could could have a special season you know jeff munkin's been incredible there they win games back-to-back -back seasons a few years ago, the end of the season in the polls. And you look at their look at some of their losses over time to a really good Texas San Antonio team. Um, they lost by just six points to their secondary arch rival Air Force. And then Troy, they lost by just a single point. So uh San Antonio won their conference. Troy won their conference. Coastal was in their conference title game. Wake Forest, when Wake was full health, this was a tough season for Army, and uh, they just came up one game shy of a bowl. Um, so I I'm curious how Army kind of bounces back after the disappointment. For Navy, they, they pretty much knew that their season was was going to be not so hot when they were two and five at one point. So th this game's basically turned into their Super Bowl, uh, knowing that they they had nothing and, and they've been able to focus really since mid October on this game. I, I'm with you, Matt. Navy has um, some impressive moments. You know, they, they beat Central Florida. They almost beat Notre Dame. Um, th they've they've had some flashes. Um, I think Army is better if Army is invested in the game. But if Army's checked out because they can't make a bowl game, they didn't get the waiver from the NCAA for having two FCS opponents. If Army's checked out, um, Navy, you know, th this is Navy season. Um, 
I just have a hard time thinking Army would be checked out in this big game. So I, I'm siding with Army. I, I think Army just, in general, is the slightly better team. Yeah, I feel like they're the better team, and I feel like at this point they've got you know, a, a more consistent coach and a more consistent uh, run game in general. The Navy's been sloppy the last couple of seasons, you know, and this game, because of when it's played, tends to be in some really gnarly conditions. Um, so I am it's supposed to be like mid 40s in Philadelphia. Yeah, it's yeah, low it's, right now it's saying low 40s and sunny, but it's Philadelphia in December. So anything is really <laughs> possible. So, uh, you know, obviously with, you know, uh, with, with some of the like influx of conferences here, a little bit more, uh, more shifting around. Do you think Navy would, uh, would reconsider their sticking? Cause, um, you know, army, got better once they went back to independent army or or, uh, air force is sort of the oddball that they've been always in a conference and and have found success. But uh. yeah, but I feel like at air force geographically considering their location, they needed more to be in a conference. It's a lot easier to find in, you know, teams willing to travel to Annapolis or even West point than it is to, uh, Colorado Springs. It's it's just tougher to get to. There's less yeah. teams that are even, you know, regional to them. So, yeah. you know, I to me it makes sense. But yeah, I, I I like Army here. But you know, again, it's it's a rivalry game throughout the records, and it'll be some great triple option football. Um, I always look forward to this game every year, not only because it's Army Navy, but because. I like this type of football, man. I love watching the triple option. I love watching some weird broken wishbone formations <laughs> and like, you know, motioning into, a, a, you know, triple option counters and things like that. Like, I absolutely love that. That is a, that is enjoyable football for me as a fan to watch. So, you know, I will. I grew up rooting for Navy. I'm not really sure why I just did. But uh, so I, I guess I'm going to say go Navy beat Army, even though I think Army's going to win. There we go. Plus, you uh, you had that uh, impressive dynasty while in college with uh, with Navy. Yeah, uh, one, one of my three greatest dynasties of all time, you know, with uh, them. I had uh, Colorado State and one at Ole Miss. My th- were, 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 were the three greats. <laughs> I forget which year it was, but there's this weird, uh, weird bug in the in the game where if you were in all out punt block formation and then uh, took over one of the end rushers and ran him back. So you have uh, nine guys rushing, but your your opponent had to stay all cramped in the middle there. And then you and then as the returner catches the ball, you take control of him, but you've rushed that extra blocker back. You could get a uh, punt return for touchdown essentially every time. And I remember this epic dynasty. I was at Rice. I got invited to join the Big 12. And uh, a game against Nebraska, I could not stop Nebraska at all. They, they, uh, um, whenever they, whenever they uh, had a, a drive, they would score a touchdown. I, I was never getting field goals. I was, I was never slowing them down. I was never getting interceptions. But... If I got a punt, I was able to return the punt for a touchdown against them. And I also found a similar trick in kickoff returns. So every time Nebraska kicked off, I was returning the kick. So they had about, I want to say about seven or so offensive touchdowns. And I had eight special teams touchdowns to steal the game from them. Well done, sir. (laughs) Well done. And I think on that story, it is time for us yeah. to uh, wrap it up here today. Josh, you have, uh, we, we didn't even talk about the college football playoff selections because we'll do I'm, that with our bowls. We'll do that with the That's bowls. And, and I mean, like, it's not postseason yet. It's Army Navy. It's yeah, not postseason it's, yet. It's, it's Army Navy. And on top of that, like, what, what else were they going to do? Put Alabama in? Give me a break. So, no. Um, no controversy. Yeah. No, no controversy here. Okay. Well, uh, R.I.P. Kirstie Alley. There we go. Oh, yeah. 
There you go. That's a, that's my cheers mug. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, oh, Josh, since we started recording, uh, it looks like uh, Jeff Brom uh, is leaving Purdue for Louisville. Yeah, I uh, I sort of thought that was uh, was a distinct possibility. Played for Louisville from Louisville, um, raised the floor for Purdue. Purdue is in way better condition than when uh, Daryl Hazel was there. And if it's uh, if I feel like I'm smiling and I've got, as they said in Seinfeld, a restrained joy, it's because Iowa could never beat him. <laughs> He kicked our asses every year, but this season, uh, of course, the year Purdue makes the Big Ten title game. But no, he he did great work at Purdue. Uh, he's going home. It sucks for Purdue, but they are in a way better p- position. They should be able to hire a really, really good head coach. And uh, they, they should give Brian Ferentz a try, too. That'd be my first call. Why not? Why not? All right. Well, that's going to do it for us here tonight on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. So... On behalf of our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton, who will be back with us next week, we will lure him out of the transfer portal, and our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook, up there in Chicago, Illinois. This is Matt Perkins in Nashville saying so long, and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. I heard Coach say he's transferring to wherever Graham Mertz goes, and I'm going to team up. Oh, so I guess they're going to end up at uh, Walla Walla Community College together. (laughs) Perfect.